I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory. And today I want to talk about French maritime pine bark, which is a potential treatment for chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and kind of chronic cognitive issues. So I'm going to be presenting one of my published clinical trials. So a lot of my work is cutting edge. It's looking at things that have never been used in people before. Uh, but these things take a really long time to develop, get through the regulatory processes, and to get out to people to use. So in addition to that work, I spend a percentage of my time looking at things that people can use right now, so existing treatments. Now, some of those are repurposed drugs, which is where we take something that's already FDA approved for one indication, and then we test it in another. So I may take something that's being used in Alzheimer's disease or uh, multiple sclerosis, and then tested in fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. Or sometimes it's a botanical and something that you can go to a store and pick up right now. And of course, the reason I do that is realizing how long the wait is for these blockbuster things that we're trying to develop. I want to give you something that you can use right now while you're waiting and, and hopefully take the edge off of the condition or mitigate some of the problems. Uh, in the meantime. So this is one of those cases that I'm presenting today. So let's talk about French maritime pine bark. This is a Mediterranean tree. It's got a really old and pretty interesting history where the pine bark is used in teas. And it wasn't until, I think it's in the 1990s, at least that's when I started to see the scientific literature, where there was a proprietary extract, which is called pygnogenol. So this happened in, I think, early 1990s. And this pygnogenol extract made it a lot easier to research French maritime pine bark because all the comp there's so many compounds in the pine bark, these ratios are now standardized, and now the extraction process is standardized. And at that point, once we had an easier-to-use product, the research exploded. Now we have about 500 scientific studies on French maritime pine bark. Now, the reason I got interested in this particular product is there is some good evidence of the anti-inflammatory action that I'm looking for, for treating gopher illness and fibromyalgia and myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. It reduces C-reactive protein. It reduces interleukin-1 beta. And it also seems to increase, increase interleukin 10, which is actually an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So it kind of works on both sides and just creates some actions that I'm very interested in. And also, I'm really interested in this product or this compound because it appears to correct or aid cerebral blood flow. And particularly for ME-CFS, there is a hypothesis that some of the cognitive issues is due to poor oxygen perfusion in the brain because of the vascular system. There's not good cerebral blood flow. So this could potentially help the cerebral blood flow issues, which would help cognition. And this does seem to help cognition in at least, I would say, five clinical trials. Um, not a huge effect. It won't take you from having severe, severe cognitive problems, but it definitely seems to aid individuals with below normal functioning in specific cognitive tests. So it seems to help blood flow, it seems to help with pain and fatigue, and it also seems to help with um, specifically inflammatory pain of the joints as well, like osteoarthritis. So it just has a lot of effects that I'm interested in. Now, in addition to that, I have to note that it does seem to lower blood glucose if your blood glucose is high, and it seems to lower blood pressure if your blood pressure is high. And those are two effects that probably most people in the United States at least uh, could use help with. So those are aided or added benefits for a lot of people. So let's go through the nomenclature really quick and keep that really straight. We've got French maritime pine, which is the tree. Of course, you can take the bark out of that and make a tea. It's not the recommended way to use it these days. Then you have French maritime pine bark extract, which any Anyone could start a company and develop a way of extracting the compounds from the pine bark and turning that into whatever um, product they want. Usually it's a powder. So French maritime pine bark can be from any source. 
And there are a few companies that are working with French Maritime Pine Bark Extract. And then there's Pignogenol. And Pignogenol is a trademarked product that's owned by a single company. And so you have options. Um, and I can't say whether one is better than the others. Uh, I've only used Pignogenol, the trademark uh, version. Um, so I don't know. Um, they have different ratios of some of the active compounds, and I can't talk to the other ones. So what I can say is by using pignogenol, you are using the same substance that was used in the vast majority of scientific studies. And so at least you know that what you were trying is what was actually tested. And there is an ad advantage to that. But again, I can't criticize the other products. I just don't know anything about them. So let's take a look at the paper here. Here's our publication. It's in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. And again, as with all my papers, it's got a long title. This is a placebo-controlled, pseudo-randomized crossover trial of botanical agents for Gulf War illness, curcumin, boswellia, and French maritime pine bark. The lead author is Emily Donovan. Uh, she ran this entire trial, and she's now finishing her clinical psychology internship in the Florida VA system. And then I imagine she will be getting her PhD after the internship very, very soon in clinical psychology. So we took in the study 10 men with goal for illness. And again, this is a condition that has similarities with fibromyalgia and MECFS. Uh, this is a pilot study, so it's very small. And I'll always say this, I, my first study, I always do in 10 people just to see if there's anything that's interesting. And then I usually do a 50 person study, then a 100 person. I have not done those. I'm, I've only done a 10 person study. So the caveat is it's hard to know how to work in everyone based on just 10 people. It's just not enough to have a generalizable sample. But anyway, it shows us whether there's something interesting or not to, to investigate further. So I've got 10 men with Gulf War illness. They had a month of baseline, a month of placebo, a month of low-dose pycnogenol, and a month of high-dose pycnogenol. The low-dose was 200 milligrams a day, and the high-dose was 400 milligrams a day. And those were divided half morning and half night. So you take half the dosage in the morning and half at night. And we used pure encapsulations, pycnogenol. So we used the trademarked version. So here's the results. We're going to focus only on the things in the green box because the other bars are for other compounds. We're just going to talk about maritime pine bark. What we have here is overall disease severity in Gulf War. So this is a combination of pain, fatigue, cognitive complaints, sleep problems, and mood complaints. And so this is not a, it goes up to 100. So this is not a horrendously affected, severe group. So I would call this kind of moderate severity GWI. So keep that in mind. Anyway, the first bar, the dark gray, is their severity at baseline. Then they have their severity at the, the light gray bar is severity with placebo. Then we have low dose, pycnogenol, and then high dose, pycnogenol, and kind of the tight circle bars or the top dots. So what you can see here is that there was a considerable placebo effect in this group. So they had a pretty substantial reduction of symptoms even before they started taking the pycnogenolins. That's something to keep in mind. Then when they started the low dose, that month of low dose, we didn't see really any change in their overall GWI symptoms. But when they moved over to the high dose, there was a significant, statistically significant drop in their symptoms. So again, we didn't see with low dose, but we did see an improvement with the high dose. Now, that means that the high dose was the only dosage to show a statistically significant benefit over placebo. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that high dose is best. And the reason is low dose always came before high dose in this particular study. That means that when these individuals started to take high-dose pycnogenol, they'd already been taking low-dose for a month. That means that the effects that we see with high-dose could be because of the dosage, but it could also be because of the duration. They'd been taking the capsules for longer, and maybe that's the reason why it showed the benefit. In fact, there are 
more than one, several studies that show that the benefits are not realized until you've been taking the capsules for a few weeks. And so because of this particular design of the small study, I can't um, detangle those two possibilities. Is it the dosage or is it the duration? And so I would say based on the dosages used by other studies, I would suggest starting with a dosage of 100 milligrams per day or 200 milligrams a day and testing that and not going straight into 400 milligrams. I would save that in case the 100 or 200 was not working and then maybe move into the higher dosage later. It seems to be fine as long as you keep your dosage below 500 milligrams a day. That's what most studies have shown to be safe. And again, whenever possible, splitting between morning and night dosing, half and half. Uh, I did look at pain and fatigue specifically. The pycnogenol helped pain with both the low and high dose, but fatigue was only benefited at the high dose of pycnogenol. And again, that may have been a duration effect. I did want to note that. So the question is, should you use it based on this? Now, based on this one study, not enough evidence. However, this is just one piece of the evidence. And there's this kind of accumulating evidence coming from a variety of studies showing that, yeah, it seems to help with a lot of people's chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and uh, cognitive issues. So I think for some people, maybe a lot of people, it's worth trying. If you've tried other things and you still have these issues, you don't know what else to use, this could be a, a credible alternative or, or option. Uh, it seems to be well tolerated. Um, we didn't have any issues in our small study. That's not saying much with 10 people, but there are other studies that are much larger and there do not seem to be really any significant side effects. And most individuals should not experience any side effects at all. Uh, when they do come up, I think the two that I see the most are dizziness. I would guess, just a guess, but I would guess that these are individuals who had really low blood pressure and maybe the pycnogenol reduced their blood pressure a little bit more and it was enough to make them feel dizzy. Uh, that could especially be the case, you know, if you're getting up from a chair or from the bed um, and if it does lower blood pressure in an individual, sure, it could make you dizzy. So that's something to watch out for. And then I think the other side effect I see um, mentioned a lot is upset stomach. And that's just... There's nothing particular with French maritime pine bark to cause stomach upset. Really, any treatment upset stomach is usually the first or second most common complaint because you never know how something's going to interact with your own particular um, GI system. So nothing unusual there. Uh, again, most people do not notice any side effects at all as long as you're keeping below the 500 milligrams per day. Now, there are some theoretical concerns. As I mentioned before, there is some evidence that this can reduce, if you have high blood sugar, this has been shown to help that and reduce your blood sugar. If you have high blood pressure, this has been shown to reduce your blood pressure. Those have both been shown. Now the question is, is what if you already have low blood glucose? What if you already have low blood pressure? Will it take you too low? That's a theoretical concern. That has never been reported in a human. I don't think it's ever been shown in an animal. But it is a, again, I keep saying theoretical, it is a potential concern that if you're already low, it might take you lower. But we don't know that it actually does that. It could be that it only reduces those things if they're abnormally high. But if you do have issues with hypoglycemia, if you have issues with hypotension, then you'd want to talk to your physician before you try this. And you would want to monitor it and make sure it's okay and it's not further lowering something that's already too low. And so you would have to track that. The other theoretical concern that I've seen mentioned in several uh, web-based sources, there, this, there was, there's a warning that keeps coming up saying that if you have a, an autoimmune disorder like lupus or multiple sclerosis, you may want to avoid this because it stimulates the immune system. I have no idea what that is about. First of all, the, the term stimulate immune system is almost meaningless. The, the immune system is so complicated. You can't just stimulate it, but that's a topic for another talk probably. Moreover, I can't quite, I can't find the source for these claims. I think 
this is a guess, but what I think happened is there was a rodent study that was testing pycnogenol in rodents that had suppressed immune system parameters and it raised their T cells and B cells and kind of normalized those levels. So they were already, it was already pathologically suppressed immune systems that was benefited by the pycnogenol. And so I think what happened is someone read or people read that study and said, oh, it boosted your T cells and B cells. Oh, so if you have an autoimmune problem, maybe it'll boost those cells too much and exacerbate the autoimmune condition. Again, okay, I could see that that's possible, but I've never seen any evidence that that actually happens. Now, if someone knows of a study that I've missed somehow where that's been shown, I don't think it exists. But if it does, be sure to leave it in the comments and I will definitely take a look and uh, I'll put a, a note to correct that if, if it exists. But I think that's what happened. I think it was a misunderstanding or a mis, uh, misinterpretation of a study that has correct implications or correct results, but I think it was extrapolated a bit too much. Just because it raises T cells and B cells doesn't mean that it's like boosted the immune system in a way that would make autoimmune conditions worse. But just be aware that that warning is out there. And so it's something to consider if you have one of these autoimmune conditions. So anyway, this is something else to look into. Again, not a ton of evidence. I can't say, hey, go out and try it right now. You gotta, you gotta go on this. It'll help you out. I cannot say that. We will do more studies. Other groups will, more, will do more studies. It's something you can get a hold of now. There's lots of sources and it seems pretty well safe. So it's worth looking into. I've looked at the videos a little bit online, mostly YouTube, and the videos I saw looked generally okay. The, the information quality looked fine. The only problem I saw is a few videos go a little bit too far in mentioning all the conditions that can be helped by pygnogenol. So they'll say, oh, it helps. I'm not even going to list them really. It helps this neurodegenerative thing and this immune thing and, and this brain thing and this body thing. And the list was getting quite long in a few cases. And I know some of those have never been tested in properly sized clinical trials. And so I think they're a bit too optimistic. Now, maybe pigogenol will ultimately help those things as well, but I think it's premature to mention some of those right now. It's just kind of a hypothetical, theoretical, um, best cases, guesses of how it may help. And so it needs more research. Aside from that, most of the information I saw was pretty, was pretty reasonable. So I think it's okay for you to go and look at some other videos about um, how to use pigogenol and, and maybe looking at different sources. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I hope that is useful. And I will be back next week. See ya.